You don't have to sit there and stare at a screen with your eyes popping out of your head. Because this isn't TV. It's Basil's LP. So you'll just have to listen instead. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I've saved up my money and bought a guitar. I'm learning to play it and how to change key, 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 key. If I practice a lot, then I might be a star. Like John Lennon, George Harrison, Pete Seeger and Donovan, old Uncle Bert Whedon and all, old Uncle Bert Whedon and all. Oh, oh my goodness, I beg your pardon. I play it all night, it's becoming a strain. My guitar's out of tune, and my voice is off key. The dog starts to howl, Ow! and the neighbors complain. <laughs> they bang on the walls and make telephone calls to the police and the local town hall. Old Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. <laughs> How's the record going? I don't know. I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> well, I promise you, if it turns out all right, I'm going to buy one. I've got a very good collection of LPs. Oh, so have I, Mr George. I like the folk singing groups. Me too, Basil. Yeah. Have you got the six boyfriends on an LP? I've got six girlfriends on the QT. Is that a record? <laughs> well, it's not bad for a little fella like me. <laughs> <laughs> you are a nut. Basil, you know, you should do a folk song. Huh? If your voice is right, that is. What's your range? Oh, about 300 yards. That should be enough. Now, do you know Mr. Frog went a-courting? Do you really? I didn't even know he was interested in anyone. Of course, I haven't seen Mr. Frog for ages. I did call on him once, but he adopted. <laughs> you stupid. I was talking about the song Frog went a-courting. Oh, yes. About the frog who went a-courting a mouse. Oh, dear. I'm not sure I remember the words. Uh, don't worry about the words. I'll sing the first part to give yeah. you a reminder. OK? Ready? Right. Here we go. Mr. Frog went a-courting and he did ride, mm -hmm. well, that's nice. Mr. Frog went a-courting and he did ride, mm -hmm. Mr. Frog went a-courting and he did ride, a sword and pistol by his side, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You got the idea, Basil? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I'm with you, Mr. George. <laughs> Good. Well, you come in when I give you the signal. Right, he ho On a big white horse he rode mm -hmm. To where Miss Mouse had heard a boat mm -hmm. Upon a big white horse he rode And galloped down the frog and toad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, Basil. What, what, what's Basil, that, what's, uh, what's all this frog and toad business? Ah, well, it's Cockney rhyming slang, Mr George. It's frog and toad. Rude. He galloped down the road, you see. Uh, well, please, we don't want the Cockney rhyming slang. Uh, you sing the proper words uh, and come in when I give you the signal. Right here. He galloped at a frantic pace. Mm -hmm. Like he was riding in a race. Mm -hmm. 
He galloped at a frantic pace. He slipped and fell flat on his face. <laughs> he went up to Missy Mousy's door. <laughs> He'd been there many times before. <laughs> Up to Missy Mousy's door. She said, I know what you're here for. <laughs> <laughs> Then he took Missy Mouse upon his knee. <laughs> Saying, Missy Mouse, will you marry me? <laughs> Then we could raise a family. A mock for you and a flouse for me. <laughs> Basil, yeah, uh, Basil, please. Yes. What's the matter now? What Basil? are you talking huh? about? A mock for you and a flouse for me. Ah, well. I thought, if a frog and a mouse got married, their children would be mocks or frouses. <laughs> or should it be fries? Or freezes, perhaps? <gasps> I love those freezes to pieces. <laughs> Dear Mr. Frog, Missy Mouse, he said, mm -hmm. A sheltered life I've always led. Mm -hmm. I need permission to get wet. I'll have to ask the Uncle Fred. <laughs> There's a coffee bar in Oxford Street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's food and drink upon the shelf of young. We got it on the National Health. Mm -hmm. So get the bottle from the shelf. If you want any more, you can see it yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. A moment's peace. That's that John Peel fellow again. I'm fed up with the sound of his horn in the morning. I wouldn't mind if he could play the blooming thing. I say, can't you play Stardust or something? <clears throat> you hello, Telly Ho, and all that sort of thing. And Tantivy and Yoitsy, you too. Jeez, oh, yourself. I'm talking to my friends. Phew. Uh, Thank goodness he's gone. Now, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Gather round my young companions And we'll have a little hush While I tell to you a tale that's true The tale of Basil for us He's the smartest fox in England You should see the huntsmen blush When they're far behind And cannot find the trail of Basil for us Tally-ho! Tally-ho! Tally-ho, and away they go Over hill and over dale Following the old fox trail But they'll never catch young Basil Makes no difference how they rush You can take it from me But the most they'll see Is the jig jig jiggling wig wig wiggling tail Of Basil Brush that bugle boy again. I say, you there, young fella. Yes, sir? Have you seen a fox fast this way? Who, oh, sir? Me, sir? No, sir. Well, where's that little pounder got to? He's never around when he's wanted. These dashed foxes have got no consideration. Uh, 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 no, come on, gee up, Carnaby. Carnaby? That's a funny name for a horse. Must be a clothes horse. Ah, 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 a clothes horse! Silly old fool. <laughs> All dressed up in scarlet jackets, they wouldn't look so ludicrous if they sat instead at home and read the tale of Basil Brush. There's the squire, that great big fat man, like a hippo, hot on must, and his poor old horse can't stay the course on the trail of Basil Brush. Tally ho, tally ho, galloping across the plain, answering the huntsman's call. Blimey, here we go again. It's lots of fun to make them run, and it makes them look ridiculous when they're chasing me. The most they see is the dig, dig, jiggling, wig, wig, wiggling tail of their 
Razzle Brush. Look out, he's coming back. He'll never jump that hedge. I say, look out for the duck pond. Riding isn't easy, you know. I've tried it. I didn't know that anything stuffed with hay could be so hard. <laughs> ah, there's me trusty steed. I've spent many happy hours in the saddle, peddling through the countryside. I'd better have a quick check before I get on the road. Now, let's see. Makes all right. Yes. Uh, well working. Uh -huh. uh, hello. That's not safe. The saddle's too high for me. Oh, I let the tires down a bit. Ah, that's better. Right. Oh, I think everybody ought to have a bicycle. They're very popular, you know. My auntie Lily's on a cycling tour up north at the moment, and she must be doing very well. On the radio this morning, the weatherman said, "Auntie's cycling over the Hebrides." Keep it up, Auntie! <laughs> Out of the way, everybody! Buy a bicycle, try a bicycle. Cycling is the safest way to go. You save your money and then you get a spanner or two and a puncture set. A bicycle pump, a lighting pack, white at the front and red at the back. Tighten the saddle, adjust the brakes. Remember you mustn't make any mistakes and practice for a week or so. Always follow the rule of the road and never become a fool of the road. Cycling is the safest way to go. Tumpty tumpty tum, tumpty tumpty tum. Oh, hello. I'm coming to a junction. Oh, and there's a policeman on point duty. Oh, I must do all the right things. My friend Cyril got into awful trouble the other day for giving a hand signal to a policeman. <laughs> Unfortunately, the policeman saw him do it. <laughs> oh, he's waving me on. A quick look behind. Put my right hand out. And turn. <gasps> Beautifully done, Basil. Satisfiable. Reliable. Cycling is the greatest thrill I know. Years ago, I still recall riding to school on my bicycle. I remember when I was a lad, cycling with me mum and dad. It was easy to understand them, doing their courting on the tandem in the days of long ago. And one of these days, if I get the chance, I'd better be biking the Tour de France. Cycling is the only way to go. I'll be off in the tricycle, cool as an icicle, feeling so nicicle, riding my bicycle. Cycling is the only way to go. Ah, here's where I turn left. Round we go. <laughs> Oi, you. This is a one-way street. But I'm only going one way. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's it. I'm terribly sorry, Constable. Poor old policeman. His dignity was shattered. <laughs> cool, I bet that was painful. Mind you, it was an accident. I should have taken notice of my horoscope that morning. The stars told me it wasn't my day. Actually, I, I'm not superstitious. It might bring me bad luck. <laughs> but my Uncle Charlie, he's terribly superstitious. He'll never walk under a black cat. And he refuses to go to work any week with a Friday in it. <laughs> Still, I shouldn't have run into that policeman, should I? Silly thing to do. In front of all those people, too. Very embarrassing. Basil, you <laughs> must be joking. Oh, hello, Mr. George. Oh, what do you mean, I must be joking? Well, somehow I can't picture you getting embarrassed about anything. Let's face it, you're not exactly a bashful Basil, are you? Well, sometimes I am. I can get embarrassed the same as anyone else. I mean, for instance, look what happened the other evening. You know that lady who lives in the flat across the landing? You mean Mrs. Brown? Yes, Mrs. Brown. Mm -hmm. Charming lady. But she came banging on my door... Just as I was getting into bed. And you had to open the door in your nightgown? Oh, no. I haven't got a door in my nightgown. <laughs> oh, I was embarrassed. 
I emperor's never been so harassed. Ah, oh, come on, Basil. What was there to get embarrassed about? Well, I don't mind people visiting or dropping in for tea. But I can't meet Mrs. Brown when I'm in my nighty gown. Remember you're a gentleman and always be polite. Say welcome, Mrs. Brown. Come in. What? At half past nine at night? So what's wrong with that? Well, I'm shy, Mr. George, I'm shy. I really can't understand why. You should welcome a guest as they taught you in school. When I'm dressed in my nighty, I feel such a fool. So what did you do in the end? Please give me an honest reply. Well, I took off my nighty and opened the door. Cause I'm shy, Mr. George, I'm shy. You shouldn't get embarrassed over silly little things. When you talk to girls, you blush. Now that's silly, Mr. Brush. I had a girlfriend once, and we were going to be wed. But I couldn't face the wedding. So I sent me friend instead. <laughs> <laughs> you silly fool. Well, I'm shy, Mr. George, I'm shy. You can get over that if you try Men who are bashful are left on the shelf As a baby I pinned on my nappy myself <laughs> I've seen you go red in the face Hell? When your aunt tries to kiss you goodbye Oh then, and I pull down the blind when I'm changing my mind Cause I'm shy, Mr. George, I'm shy Oh, it's tough to be rough, to be more than enough To be ever so terribly shy Boom, boom! When men of honor battled for their right, the land was filled with castles and the days were filled with knights. Basil was a farmer's boy who won a thousand fights. Villains used to tremble when they heard his name. He found a suit of armor and he cleaned it till it shone. He had to use a spanner when he put his trousers on. He vowed to fight oppression until tyranny was gone. And everywhere he went, they heard his battle cry. He was a brave, brave man. The farmer, the man in shining armor, fought against injustice with his sword held high. And all his enemies used to tremble at the knees. And everywhere he went, they heard his battle cry. Seated on his desk, yeah, and ready for the fray, his honor was unquestioned, and the minstrels used to say, He fought a dozen battles in a normal working day. Villains used to tremble when they heard his name. Many were the criminals that Basil put to flight. He'd clobber every baddie every dark and dirty night. He won the reputation as defender of the right. And everywhere he went, they heard his battle cry. He was a brave, brave man. Basil, the farmer, the man in shining armor, fought against injustice with his sword held high. And all his enemies used to tremble at the knees, and everywhere he went they heard his battle cry. The farmer, the men is shining. Oh, hello. Sorry to keep you waiting, but the gentlemen of the orchestra haven't come back from lunch. I don't suppose the landlord's called time yet. <laughs> oh, it's a marvellous place, this recording studio. All those dials and tape machines and turntables. Oh, I'd like to be a recording engineer. But it must be a nerve-wracking job, living on spins and needles. 
are living on spins and needles. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> hey, listen. What's all that cheery? Oh, of course. The posters are all over town. There's a bustle at the station, it's a kind of celebration, cause they're welcoming a very special train. With gaily painted caravans and hundreds of exciting fans are welcoming the circus back again. Whenever the circus comes to town, the audience comes from miles around. Entertainment's what that after, and there's lots of happy laughter as they meet at the circus ground. The setting is like a fairyland. Listen to the music of the beat brass band. Roll up, roll up. There's plenty of fun for everyone whenever the circus comes to town. See the boxing kangaroo, the elephants, and the horses too. Everything that goes to make a show. The chimpanzees, the daring young man on the flying trapeze Hear the people shout, Rabbissimo! Whenever the circus comes to town The audience love to see the crowd Happiness is what they're after And the pinch is filled with laughter As his big baggy pants fall down Animals join the big parade in the grand procession as the music's played. Roar, roar! There's plenty of fun for everyone whenever the circus comes to town. Oh, here comes the ringmaster! Hooray! Oh, I say, look at that man on the trapeze. Isn't he marvelous? Uh, I beg your pardon. No, of course he can't work without a net. His hair would fall over his eyes. <laughs> the animals join the big Robin Hood. Hope he did. <laughs> he only robs the rich because the poor haven't any money. <laughs> so I'm all right. I'm skinned. <laughs> Probably only my imagination, anyway. <laughs> there is someone behind me. Who's there? <laughs> well, I'm blowed. I've got a little bear behind. Little baby bear. Hello, little bear. <coughs> What's your name? <coughs> Fred. Uh, that's a funny name for a bear. Uh, little Fred Bear. <coughs> oh, 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 I'm terribly sorry. Did my laugh frighten you? It frightens me sometimes. <laughs> Where do you live? <coughs> At the circus. Of course. I know your mummy and daddy. Bertie and Gertie, the dancing bears. Yes. Uh, what are you doing all alone in the woods at this time of night? <laughs> what? Oh, you're lost. <laughs> oh, never mind. Look, look, don't cry. Oh, come on now. Stop your grizzling. Uh, you're not a grizzly bear, are you? Oh. Uh, of course you're not. Now, here's my hanky. Now, blow. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, that's better. Now. I can't leave you wandering about the woods in your bare skin, can I? You might finish up as a guardsman's hat or something. <laughs> Look, you come home with me, little Fred Bear, and I'll telephone your mummy and tell her you're safe. I don't live very far from here. <laughs> come on now, give us your hand. That's right. <laughs> Haven't we had a lot of weather lately? Ah. <laughs> I'll bring him back to the circus in the morning. Yes, 
I'll look after Mrs. Gertie. Give my love to Mr. Bertie. Good night. Ah, well, little Fred Bear, that's put your mother's mind at rest. Now, take your nose out of the honey pot. There's none left. Take your snout out. That's better. If you eat any more supper, you'll go off bang. You'll be a little ruined brewing. <laughs> oh, what a mixture you've had. Corned beef, blue cheese, pickled cabbage and honey. All mixed up together. Yeah. Now, have you watched your paws? Well. Sit your prayers? Well. That's a good little bear. Now then, hop into bed. <gasps> oh, it's so heavy. Oh, you go through the mattress, I shall see you in the spring. <laughs> That's it. Nighty nighty. <laughs> what do you mean, pajamas, pajamas? I'll do the jokes. Now, I'll tuck you in. You can't sleep with the little bare feet hanging out, can you? <laughs> No, you can't watch television. It's bedtime. I don't care if your Uncle Yogi is on. Now go to sleep. Tell you a story? No, it's too late. Maybe your daddy does tell you a story every night. But I'm not your daddy, am I? Oh, dear. Oh, all right. All right. I'll tell you a story. If you promise to go to sleep. Do you know Goldilocks and the Three Bears? What do you mean the three bears were your four bears? How can three bears be four bears? Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> I see. I see what you mean. <laughs> oh, I am a fool. Yeah, yeah. Stop agreeing with me. Now let's see. How does the story begin? <laughs> That's right. Uh, once upon a time, a little family by the name of Lox lived in a cottage at the edge of a wood. Their home was a pretty little one-story building. And this is the story. <laughs> yeah, that was a good start, wasn't it? <laughs> it's not a load of old codswallop. It's a very nice story. Now listen, I won't tell it to you. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Locks had a beautiful little daughter with rosy cheeks and lovely hair that grew right down her back. <laughs> of course she had some hair on her head. I meant her long hair hung right down her back. Now shut your little muzzle and listen. Sometimes her mother made her wear her hair in a bun. But she didn't like that, because the hard currents used to scratch her neck, and pieces of bun would fall down the back of her dress, which made her say, Ooh, crumbs. <laughs> um, the little girl loved gambling in the fields, although her mother didn't like gambling, only bingo. And in the rays of the sun, her beautiful hair looked like spun gold. And so she became known as Goldilocks. Goldie's mother was very pretty, too, with big blue eyes and curly hair. And she was known as Curly Locks. But her daddy had no hair at all, so his mates at work called him Baldy Locks. No, he wasn't a skinhead. He just had a very high forehead. <laughs> well, one morning, after Mr. Locks had gone off to work... Of course he wasn't on strike. Mr. Locks never went on strike. This is a fairy story. One morning, after Mr. Locks had gone off to work, leaving the little cottage with the thatched roof and ivy clinging to the porch, Goldilocks said to her mother, Mummy, why is Auntie Ivy clinging to the porch? Your Auntie Ivy isn't herself today, replied her mother, which is a great improvement on yesterday. <laughs> now be quiet and eat your porridge, or I'll put your hair in a bun. The Locks family always had porridge for breakfast. Because, as everyone knows, porridge is very good for you. It makes you big and strong and gives you bulging muscles and puts hair on your chest. But Goldilocks didn't want to be big and strong with bulging muscles and hair on her chest. She was quite happy with her rosy cheeks and her hair growing all down her back. <coughs> yes, and on her head as well. <laughs> now, little Goldilocks wasn't in a very good mood that morning because her mother had told her she couldn't have the record player she wanted. Jimmy Young can't come and live with you, Mrs. Locks had said. He's far too busy teaching people how to make porridge. Now stop picking at your breakfast and go and pick some flowers instead. Pick your teacher. Goody Locks sighed. Can't I take an apple for the teacher? No, replied her mother. Apples are too expensive. Think they grow on trees or something? Off went Goldilocks, skipping and playing through the woods. She loved skipping and playing, 
skipping school and playing truant. She didn't like the games they played at school. Her school friends only played hopscotch with real scotch. And Goldilocks was a pop fan. She sang to herself as she tripped along the woodland path. My mother said that I never should talk to strangers in the wood. If you do, she said one day, somebody bad might take you away. Which is something that all children should remember. <coughs> yes, and little bears as well. Goldilocks was so intent on gathering flowers, she didn't realise she was wandering further and further from the path which led to the school, and deeper and deeper into the wood. At last, her little basket was filled with fresh spring flowers, and she thought to herself, I must hurry, or I shall be late. But she didn't know which path to take. An old signpost with three arms stood at the junction of the path upon which she stood. An encouraging sign, although it didn't seem very helpful. One arm said, Bear left, another arm said, Bear right, and the middle arm said, Bear's straight on. Goldilocks, being liberally minded, decided to take the middle path. The path she had chosen was dark and windy. I bet she was too. Well, I'd be windy if I were lost in the dark wood. I would. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, wait a minute. <laughs> it's not windy. No, the path was dark and windy. Yes, that's it. <laughs> yes, the path wound in and out among the trees, and poor little Goldie seemed to be getting nowhere. Suddenly she came into a clearing, and there stood a sweet little house among the trees. Smoke was coming from the chimney, and the door stood wide open. Goldilocks went to the door and tapped timidly. <laughs> What do you mean, who's Timothy? I didn't say she tapped Timothy. I said she tapped timidly. Oh, go to Bad Eyes. She tapped again, but there was no reply. She suddenly realized nobody there. Not a tenant, not a squatter. Nobody. <laughs> you may well ask. It was all very strange, because the table was set for breakfast, and steam was rising from three bowls of pottage. A big bowl, a medium-sized bowl, and a teeny, weeny, tiny, itsy-bitsy bowl, which was smaller than the others. Goldilocks had left her breakfast when she came away from home, and seeing the bowls of steaming pottage, she licked her dainty little lips and murmured, Call oh, love a duck, I'm flipping starving. And grabbing a spoon, she took a mouthful of porridge from the big bowl, and immediately wished she hadn't. Oh, lummy, she cried, that's too hot. And tried a spoonful from the medium-sized bowl, another mistake. Oh, lummy, she shouted, that's too cold. And turned to the teeny-weeny, tiny, itsy-bitsy bowl, which was smaller than the others, and her first tentative taste brought forth a shriek of delight. Oh, yummy, 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 that's just right. And in less time than it takes to do the commercial, she scoffed the blooming lot. Uh, what do you see? Uh, she don't think so, too. Standing around the table were three chairs. Uh, three chairs? Uh, Not three uh, chairs. Uh, I said three chairs. Big chair, a medium-sized chair, and a teeny-weeny, tiny, itsy-bitsy chair was smaller than the others. Oh, dear, said Goldilocks. I've walked so far this morning, my plates of meat are killing me. I must sit down and take the weight off my little scotch pigs. First, she tried sitting in the big chair. That was much too high. So she sat in the medium-sized chair, straight onto a little bag full of knitting needles, which made a ladder in her brand new tights, and shattered her composure. Then she tried the teeny-weeny tiny itsy-bitsy chair, which was smaller than the others, and a lot weaker too. As it broke into teeny weeny tiny itsy bitsy pieces, depositing Goldilocks in a heap on the floor. Oh, this just isn't my day, said Goldie, getting to her feet and pulling her mini skirt down to six inches above her knees. Oh, yeah, she sighed. Now I've been and gone and done it. She stood in the middle of the kitchen and listened. But the only sound in the room was the ticking of the clock on the mantelpiece and the singing of the kettle on the fire. But unfortunately, she didn't know the tune, so she couldn't join in the chorus. In the corner of the room 
with a winding staircase. I wonder what's upstairs, thought Goldie. The atmosphere was eerie, and Goldilocks was nosy, so she tiptoed up the stairs to see what was at the top. There, at the head of the staircase, slightly to the left of the barrister, Goldie was amazed to find a bedroom. Big deal. A cosy bedroom, with chintz on the windows, prints on the walls, and a wall to wall fitted carpet already. Facing the door were three beds. A big bed, a medium-sized bed, and a teeny weeny tiny itsy bitsy bed, which was smaller than the others. Oh dear 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 me, sighed Goldilocks. She never stops moaning, does she? <laughs> oh dear 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 me, how sleepy I am, she yawned. I'm absolutely on my little benders. I couldn't half do with a kip. So saying, she flung herself onto the big bed and landed on a bag of golf clubs. I can do without that sort of handicap, she said, and moved out of the rough onto the fairway which led to the medium-sized bed. Laying down gratefully, she got up instantly, for the medium-sized bed was full of hair clips. Goldie didn't fancy a clip round the yellow. <laughs> This one looks very comfortable, said Goldilocks, and laid down on the teeny weeny tiny itsy bed, which was smaller than the others. Then she closed the little mince pies and went to Bo Peep. Now, unknown to Goldie, this cottage belonged to three bears. <coughs> That's right, little Fred Bear, the three bears who were your four bears. A big bear, who was the father bear, medium-sized bear, who was the mother bear, and a teeny weeny tiny itsy bitsy bear, who was smaller than the others, because he was the baby bear. Well, earlier that morning, before Goldilocks arrived at the cottage, the three bears had gone out to collect firewood, and when they returned, they had no idea that little Goldie was snoring her bonds off in the room upstairs. As they entered, Father Bear threw his bundle of sticks in the fireplace and stared at the table. Uh. Who's been eating my porridge? Growled. Mother bear said, Who's been eating my porridge? And the baby bear said, Who's been eating my porridge and scoffed the blooming lot? Father bear bared his teeth and said, Hey, look at that there chair. What chair, daddy? Said baby bear. Watch your son, said father bear. How are you? <laughs> and sat down in his own big chair. The seat was still warm. Who's been sitting in my chair? He said. Mother Bear said, Who's been sitting in my chair? And broke my knitting needles. And the baby bear looked at what was left of his teeny weeny tiny itsy bitsy chair, which was smaller than the others, and said, Who's been sitting in my chair? A great fat lump. There's something funny going on here, Phyllis, said Father Bear to his wife, which was a strange thing to say, because her name was Edith. Let's have a look up the apples and pears. The three bears hurried up the staircase and into the bedroom. As he went through the door, the Father Bear hid his nuts. Who's been sleeping in my bed? cried. And bent my number three iron. Mother Bear said, Who's been sleeping in my bed and upset all my bear hair clips? Baby Bear looked at his teeny weeny tiny itsy bitsy bed, which was smaller than the others, and saw the pretty little golden haired girl lying there. Caw! he said. Look what Father Christmas has brought me. Goldilocks woke with a start and seeing the three bears standing over her was more than she could bear. So she sprang out of bed, dashed down the stairs and out of the cottage, and ran and ran and ran, till she reached home, vowing never, never to go deep into the woods again. Ah, well, there, little Fred Bear. Did you like that story, little Fred? Ah. <laughs> Bless his little fairy hide. He's barely awake. <coughs> Close your eyes, little Fred. Shh. 
Go to sleep, little fellow. We'll stay by your side. Go to sleep, and we'll watch over you. While a friendly old moon gazes down from the sky in a star dusty blanket of blue, there's a gentle wind playing a song in the trees and the big top. Is swaying in time with the breeze. In the old Milky Way, all the stars seem to say, "Go to sleep, little fella, and dream." Little fella and dream.